All right, tonight we'll uh, mark message number 14 in our, uh, in the series that we're dealing with right, right now. In the main, we're discussing the doctrine of salvation. Uh, however, we've actually departed from that just a little bit uh, to give a rebuttal to the Calvinist view of things. And I'm doing that on purpose. I mean, there's Calvinism is just running rampant uh, through the theological world today. So I feel like it's important. What are sometimes called or looked at as Calvinist proof texts, right? These are texts that seem to offer prima facie support for the deterministic understanding of the nature of God's control. They believe that God determines all things. That's how he is sovereign. In fact, that's what it means to be sovereign in the Calvinist worldview. And one such text that is often trumpeted by Calvinists or people who hold that deterministic view was actually referenced in a recent message, uh, albeit not in support of Calvinism, but rather to bolster a particular understanding of God's control over our governmental leaders. And the passage that was cited is Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number one. It's quite a famous verse. It's one that Calvinists love because, as I mentioned, it seems clearly to imply that God has exhaustive control and, in fact, deterministic control over the will and over the decisions of all men. And if the verse does, in fact, teach that, then it would be a huge boon to their position because, as we've seen in this series, according to the common Calvinist understanding, if man, if any man has independent control of his will, then God is not sovereign. That's their view. So at any rate, since this verse may be on the minds of some, and it was on my mind, I wanted to address it. So let's stand together and open our Bibles to Proverbs 21 and verse number 1. Proverbs 21 and verse number 1. The Bible says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. Pretty clear verse, it seems. So we're going to handle this tonight. I want to preach to you a message entitled, Surrender and Be Blessed. Surrender and be blessed. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. It's amazing and wonderful. I thank you, God, for the help uh, that you give us through the community of believers, even worldwide, to help study and keep things in their proper context. It's a wonderful blessing to me, Lord, and I pray that you'd help me to pass on the things that I've learned to others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, this passage directly asserts that the king's heart is in the hand of, that is controlled by God. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, most people agree on, the, on at least this much. Let's start with some terms and define those, and maybe it'll help us. Most people agree that the heart is what we'll call the seat of, or the, or the wellspring where our desires emanate, right? It, it could mean more than that, but the heart is at least that. It's the seat of our desires. And if that is so, it's highly significant. Because, at least for Calvinists, uh, it would be significant. Because according to their theology, or at least according to the brand of Calvinism espoused by its leading champions today, such as John Piper uh, and others in his camp, which is in turn dependent on Jonathan Edwards, According to them, a person always chooses according to their greatest desire. Okay, fine. That's not really all that controversial, except if, it, if God controls our greatest desire, then you can see the problem. Right? You can see, that. I mean, if God controls our desires, then of necessity, he also controls our choices. <laughs> 
right? If we always choose according to our desire and God gives us our desires, then God controls our choices. Does everybody follow me? So you can see right away the problem. Now, looked at with this understanding, this is the Calvinist view, and looked at with this understanding, the passage clearly teaches that God completely controls the human will. I mean, this is, this is sovereign determinism, right? In fact, he determines our desires and choices, moving them, the verse says, in any direction that he pleases. Just like the rivers of water. If he wants it to go over here, fine. If he wants it, channels it over there, he, he can do that, Okay. And again, by these lights, by the Calvinist lights, the intentions of our heart are not in our control, but in God's control, and he alone is able to direct their course. Now, if you're not familiar with Calvinism, this may seem completely radical to you. You're like, well, what about free will? Calvinists don't believe in free will. Okay, so just accept that, right? Uh, This is a, this view of God controlling the desires and therefore the choices of all people, that perfectly encapsulates the standard Calvinist position. Now, even though the text only mentions the heart of the king, Calvinists feel comfortable drawing a universal application based on the fact that the king represents the people, right? He's the supreme embodiment of of the nation. And so, whatever is true of him must likewise be true of the people. It's, it's an argument from the greater to the less. If it's, if it's true in the greatest case, then certainly it's true in the least of cases. Right? So the question for us is, that's the Calvinist understanding. How do we push back on that? How do we say, how do we interpret it differently? Well, we push back on it. There are several ways to push back, but here are some that I find compelling. Okay? And the first is just absolutely crucial because it attacks the very heart of their claim. Calvinists, watch, Calvinists need this to be a universal principle, don't they? Because they're teaching sovereign determinism over all things. God controls all events deterministically according to their view. So they need this to be a universal principle in order to substantiate their view. However, if you'll look, if you'll notice, there is absolutely nothing in the verse, nothing whatsoever to make us think that we should universalize it. It doesn't say... Everyone, it just says, the heart of the king. Okay, so one thing, we're just going to limit it in scope right away. The passage also speaks uh, of the king's heart, not of every man. But more to the point, as I'm going to show you in just a moment, this passage was almost certainly written, watch please, this is crucial. This passage was written by Solomon as a personal testimony. Okay, it's not a statement of exhaustive determinism. Solomon wrote it about himself. That's it. Second, and this is also important to grasp, all right? So first, it's not, a, it's not a universal principle. Secondly, nothing in the passage says that the Lord controls the king's heart irresistibly. Now, Calvinists imply that, and they need it to say that, But the context points in a much different direction. The rest of the chapter, as I'm going to show you in just a minute, the rest of the chapter sees the Lord's control as completely resistible. And in Solomon's case, the Lord's control was the result of his own free surrender of his will to the will of God. Right? Here's a third problem. A third problem with the Calvinists, not only is it not universal and not irresistible, it is not to say... To take the Calvinist view is not moral. The Calvinist understanding makes just a mess of the context. For example, although it is true that the king represents his people at least to some degree, right? He doesn't represent all people. Think about in the days of Ahab. He certainly, Ahab was the king. He certainly didn't represent Elijah or Obadiah or the 50 prophets that he hid or the 100 prophets that he hid, uh, hid by 50 in the cave. It didn't represent them. But anyway, The more relevant truth is that the king was to, listen, the king was to represent God to the people. Right? He was supposed to represent God to the people by his actions and by his example and and by his decisions. The king is not at liberty to simply do whatever he wants. Well, I'm the king, so bless God I can do. No. You're not able to do whatever you want. In Israel, especially, the king was to represent God and to exercise God's justice over the people. Right? That's his responsibility. 
And what Solomon is saying in this verse is that he, Solomon, is faithfully fulfilling his divinely appointed role by allowing God to control his decisions and his heart so that the decisions and choices he made are in line with the decisions that God would want him to make. Would be in line with the wisdom of God. And in fact, if you read the Kings and read the story of Solomon, you can see that. There's several examples where he has surrendered to God and says, God, give me wisdom so I can judge your people with justice and judgment and equity. And he wants to have these, uh, the, the, he wants God to be in control of his life so that the decisions he makes benefit the people. That's what Solomon is saying here. In no sense is this a statement that God is determining the choices of his heart, but rather that the king has fully surrendered his heart and his will to the will of God. It's a testimony. And you say, well, how do you know that? We'll just keep reading. The very next verse, right? It's, you can make the Bible say whatever you want if you don't keep reading. But look at the very next verse, verse 2. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth, which just means to weigh, right, or to judge. The Lord pondereth the hearts. Look at verse 3. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Okay, no, hold on. Stop and think about this. If we accept the Calvinist interpretation, right, to do that immediately thrusts you on the horns of a moral dilemma, right? Because in their view, watch please, in verse 1, God determines a person's heart. God is making you, giving you the desires that he wants you to have, and then he's causing you to choose in line with your desires. But then verse 2 says that then he ponders. He weighs, in other words, and then judges the very choices and the very decisions that he alone controls. Come on, is everybody looking up here? Does that make any sense whatsoever? Shake your head like this. No, it does not. It makes no sense whatsoever to say that God causes you to choose something and then says, why did you choose that? This is insane. Right? This is, this is nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. Moving on to verse 3 again, we see that Solomon, look, he's, he's very concerned with pleasing the Lord by doing, quote unquote, justice, that is righteousness and judgment. Just as his statement in verse 1 indicates. Solomon wants to do right. Okay? So what we have, therefore, in verses 2 and 3 is Solomon, watch please, look up here, Solomon is caught, in verses 1, 2, and 3, Solomon is contrasting a heart that is surrendered to the Lord with a heart that follows its own desires, right? A heart that is surrendered to God follows the will of God, does what God wants him to do, goes where God wants him to go. A heart that is following their own carnal desires, they go their own way. And when you go your own way, God judges that. You understand? He is not, Solomon is not making a statement of God's irresistible control over the king's heart, much less the hearts of all people at all times. Now here's another problem, which we've already covered at some length elsewhere. But just to raise the point again, if verse 1 really does teach God's exhaustive determinism through his absolute control over the hearts of all men, then it logically follows that God not only determines some king's heart to do good, but other king's hearts to do evil. Because not all kings do the right thing, do they? It would to God they did. Would to God everybody was like David. Most of the time for David. But sometimes even David does stupid things. Right? And what do we do with that? To say, as the Calvinists say about verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water, he turns it whatsoever we will. So what you're really saying then is that God is determining some people to commit sin. And beloved, I don't think I need to teach you this, but that's in direct contradiction to Scripture. Yeah. 
I mean, in this very book, in chapter 15, we're told that the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. So God is giving them thoughts that he finds disgusting? Are you kidding me? It cannot be, this verse cannot be read that way. It is, cannot be that God is somehow responsible for the wicked decisions of evil rulers. If somebody makes a bad decision, that's on them, not God. And this very chapter seems to substantiate the point. For example, if we look at the rest of the proverb, we see that Solomon contrasts the desires and actions of men that are surrendered to God with those who are in rebellion to his will. And if you'll read the whole passage, you'll see, if we read the whole chapter, which we're going to, you'll see that the text vacillates back and forth between its description of these two groups. On the one hand is a group of people whose heart is surrendered to the Lord and we see the way they behave. On the other hand is a group of people who want to go their own way and we see the way they behave. Look at it. Notice first those, those whom the chapter condemns. Go to verse 4. Who does God condemn? He starts with the proud. A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is what? Sin. God is not approved of that. That's someone going their own way. Look at verse 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. Hey, look, if you're lying, you're headed for destruction. God, that's, that's someone who's trying to get their own way through deceitful means, and God does not approve of that. Okay? Verse 7, the robbery of the wicked shall destroy them because they refuse to do judgment. Now notice right here, this verse is very interesting in light of the context because it again focuses on the refusal to act with judgment or justice, which is in contrast to the heart of the leader that is surrendered to God. Right? And for that reason, acts in justice. I mean, he's still making the same basic comparison. Look at verse 8. The way of man is froward and strange. The word strange means crooked, right? The way of man is froward and crooked, but as for the pure, his work is right. Verse 10, the soul of the wicked desireth evil. Now again, how exactly does that work? Right, how exactly on the Calvinist understanding, how does that work? If God alone controls their desires, as Calvinists claim according to verse 1, then how is it that the soul of the wicked desireth evil? I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that God is determining their desires and then also say, well, he's not responsible. I mean, which is it? The soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Look at verse 13. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Right? You don't have compassion. That's a way that's going right in your own eyes, but it's not the kind of... That's not the way that God wants us to be. Verse 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The way of understanding is the way revealed in this book. Okay. Verse 17, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. That's going your own way rather than following the way of God. Verse 24, proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. Verse 25, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Right? You're lazy and arrogant. Verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked what? Mind. Again, notice the focus here. What, a mind, that's again another word for the heart, the seat of our emotions and desires and, and our will. Notice here he's focusing on the desires and intentions of the heart. According to Calvinism, God gives us those. But here it says if they're wicked, they're an abomination to the Lord. All right? Verse 28, a false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. Like, what I'm getting at is that all of these verses provide examples of those whose way is right in their own eyes, and yet that way has been pondered and then condemned by God, as verse 2 says. Everybody with me? He just goes on through the chapter giving examples of the kind of people, desires, intentions... What happens when you want to go your own way instead of being surrendered to God? But these people, as I point out, are contrasted to those like King Solomon, whose heart was submitted to God's way rather than his own. Look in verse 1. This is the classic example. The king's heart, Solomon says, is in the hands of the Lord. I'm surrendered to him. And as the rivers of water, he turneth my heart whithersoever he will. I, I'm following his revealed leadership. 
His control. I placed myself under the control of God. Verse 3, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Verse 5, the thoughts of the diligent, if you're surrendered to God, you're going to be diligent. Okay? You want yourself, if you're following your own desires, you're going to be hasty to get what you want and end up broke. Look at verse 8. The second half of the verse says, but as for the pure, his work is right. Verse 11, second half, when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. The people who have going their own way, their way is right in their eyes. They don't listen to anybody. But when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. Verse 12, the righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthroweth the wicked for whose wickedness? Their wickedness. It is joy to the just to do judgment, verse 15 says, but the destruction shall be uh, to the workers of iniquity. Here again, notice the focus on acting in justice and righteousness. Look at verse 20. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spends it up. Verse 21. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness and honor. Verse 22. A wise man scaleth the city of the mighty and casteth down the strength of the confidence thereof. Verse 23, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Now, let's stop and look at that one again. How can anybody, look at it, it says, whoso keepeth his mouth. You, you, you're guarding your mouth. How can anyone guard his own mouth, his own tongue, his own soul from trouble if God is irresistibly controlling his or her heart like rivers of water? Verse 26, the righteous giveth and spareth not. Verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much money bringeth it with a wicked mind? All right, so I think that was one we covered last time. A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. Verse 29, as for the upright, he directeth his way. There it is again. All right, but here's what I'm trying to say. Throughout the entire chapter, watch please, this is, this is important. Throughout the entire chapter, what we see is these recurring themes of the difference between people whose hearts are committed to their own way as contrasted to those committed to the way of the Lord. It goes back and forth. People who are surrendered to God do this. People who are surrendered to, who want their own way do that. People who want, they do this. Wicked people do that. Right? From start to finish, Solomon is pitting those whose hearts and desires are submitted to the Lord and to the justice which pleases him against those whose hearts and desires are committed only to rebellion and self-will. Right? Now, dear friends, that is the context from which or in which verse 1 should be understood. For the simple reason that it makes best sense of the chapter as a whole. We don't have the whole chapter doing one thing and then this one little verse off on its own doing something totally different. When you consider the argument in its entirety, it is clear that this chapter does not intend to teach that God irresistibly controls the hearts of all men at all times. That's not the goal of the chapter. That's not what the author is doing in this chapter. The goal of the chapter is to extol the virtue of submitting our life and our conduct to the control of God. That's what the chapter's about. He's trying to get us to surrender our life, the control of our life, the reins of our life, to get out of the driver's seat, so to speak, to get in the passenger seat, and to give God the keys to our life. Is everybody with me? That's what it's about. Rather than pursuing things that please our own carnal natures. All of us wants to do that. But if we do, it leads to destruction, as the verses say. Not only of ourselves, but of the people around us. And if you're a king, that's a very bad thing because if you follow your own way, you're not only going to destroy your life, but the life of your whole nation. As we are witnessing. So as verse 10 puts it, the soul of the wicked desireth evil. But according to verse 15, it is joy to the just to do judgment. The whole thing. Now, look up here. Obviously, when I think of Solomon, I think of this. That's Solomon's life in a nutshell. Right? Solomon, at the end of his life, fell away from the Lord. 
and was no longer, at the end of his life, he was not at all concerned with what God wants. He was not concerning himself with surrendering to God's will or upholding justice as God's representative. By the end of his life, rather than be an example of godliness, he became an example of idolatry and rebellion. So much so that God ripped the kingdom out of his hands and gave ten tribes to, to Jeroboam. All right? Nevertheless, we cannot... We cannot just take the snapshot of, of Solomon's life at the end because there was a beginning that was good. Amen. Again, he started off high. He started off as the embodiment of God's wisdom, the wisest man on earth. Right? And the point is, at the time that Solomon wrote this proverb, he was fully committed to the Lord... And that's why he is extolling the superiority of a heart that is surrendered to God over hearts of the wicked who refuse to give God control and instead seek after their own way, bringing disaster on themselves in the process and leading others astray. Right at the beginning of Solomon's reign, he got it. Okay, Now, God's sway over the king's heart was due to the king freely aligning his will with the revealed will of God and yielding his desires to those of the Lord for his life and his people. And in so doing, by surrendering himself to God's control, by himself following what God wants, he was actually doing and fulfilling God's desire for what the king's role should be in contrast to what we have in our own government, where our leaders seem far more concerned with their own selfish ambitions, amen? amen. They don't give two cents. Well, I feel like the pe politicians in our country are like, you know, uh, they're like people on the Titanic. They know it's going down and they're just raiding the silverware drawers, yeah. right? They're just trying to get all the money they can before it all goes down. They're not interested in executing justice and judgment and doing right. Rather, they're just going their own way, what is right in their own eyes. But they're going to find out, as verse 2 says, that the Lord ponders those hearts. Amen. Right? At any rate, uh, is everybody following me tonight? This is clearly the best interpretation because it m most accurately fits the context as well as the overall testimony of Scripture. Okay? The Calvinist interpretation seems forced. And out of harmony with the basic concerns of the proverb as a whole. The Calvinist interpretation, it makes nonsense out of the proverb as described above by suggesting that God determines the hearts of many people to commit evil and then judges their hearts despite the fact that they had absolutely no control over their desires or subsequent actions. In effect, I'm just saying the Calvinist interpretation, watch the, watch the irony of this. The Calvinist interpretation makes a mockery of justice in, a, in the very passage that is intended to extol the virtues of justice by suggesting that God is just despite irresistibly controlling his creatures to sin and then judging them for what he determined them to do. It makes no sense. Now, thankfully, as I hope to have showed you tonight, there is no good reason whatever to accept the Calvinist interpretation. Amen? There's no reason to accept that. To the contrary, the chapter and the book as a whole is replete with evidence of our ability to freely surrender our will to the will of God. Which would be impossible, by the way, without us having some free will, some independent control over our own heart and desires. All right? So, at any rate... All this point put together points us to what I always call the world in front of the text. What is the author trying to do by telling us this? What's he trying to accomplish? And here it is. He's painting for us an ideal world, isn't he? He's trying to show us this is the kind of world where everything works right. What is the ideal world that's portrayed by this text? Clearly, it is a world in which we do not follow or trust our own desires. Amen? Amen. We don't try to go our own way. Instead, we surrender our will, right? And we allow our heart to instead be controlled by God. 
That's what the passage is trying to say. And he gives many examples of why you should want to do this. You'll be much better off. You'll be blessed and all these things if you will surrender control of your life, relinquish your own ambitions, and instead follow what God says is best. That's, what's, that's the goal of this chapter. Now, obviously, that is not easy. That's not easy. It is never easy to do right. It's never easy to do... It, it, it is easy to be lazy... It is easy to be selfish. It is easy to be indulgent. It is easy to be arrogant. It's very difficult for us to say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no to self so that I can, I'm going to put off my desires and I'm going to get up early and work hard this morning. I'm going to be humble. I'm not going to be mean. I, you know, those things are hard. It's not easy. And Solomon's own life proves it. Solomon started off and he was doing the right thing, but it's a difficult life to live. And he ended up giving it up and he crashed and burned. Okay. Nevertheless, as he points out, it is the best life. The best things don't come easy. It is difficult. But it is the life that brings blessing. And so look, what I'm, I, what I'm getting at tonight is let's surrender our lives to God and enjoy his blessing. In fact, as we stand together and prepare for our invitation, let me just encourage you. Fully surrender your heart to the Lord so that with Solomon, you too can say, all of us can say, that our heart, it's all right, you can stand together, that's fine, that's what I meant. All right? Let me encourage you, fully surrender your heart to the Lord so that with Solomon, you can say, it may not be the king's heart, but you can say, my heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as the rivers of water, he turns it with us whoever he will. That's what God wants from us tonight. Okay? He wants us to be fashioned and molded, not according to what we think is best, but according to what God knows is best in conformity with his holy and loving desire for our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. And, and it's just so simple. We... Sometimes we read a passage and it seems like, wow, what do we do with that? But when we stop to consider the whole passage, it's really not all that complicated. And you're making it very clear what you want from us. And we see it all through the Bible. This is your whole goal for our life. The purpose of the Christian life is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. <laughs> that we would just stop going our own way, stop being such a get what we want all the time and just recognize we're almost like a dog chasing a car what would we do if we, if we caught it it would hurt us we don't even know what's best for us Lord but when we just surrender our own selfish ambitions and instead determine to follow your revealed will then our life becomes blessed it's blessed not only for our own sake but it's a blessing to all those around us the people never had it so good as when Solomon was walking in obedience, doing the right things. God, help us to learn from his example and make this verse a reality in our own lives. We pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's